That we want some climate justice and we want the fair... The United States doesn't hear that climate change is directly affecting people in this moment. And so there's lots of people in the United States who by no fault of their own only hear a certain story about climate change. I think the most important thing we have an opportunity to do here at the COP is to change that story. Do we think of it as, oh, well, there's health care, there's global warming, there's this, there's that? Or do we think of climate as a banner of intersecting issues that includes everything from immigration to intellectual property rights? Until we can reach that second story, we're going to be fighting an uphill battle. Next week, I think something is going to crack. We're talking a lot about how to escalate major civil disobedience inside the COP here. But we don't know what our access is going to be. When we figure out what that trigger is, how do we react in a way that puts us in a favorable position? The justice groups are very clear that while we have access, that does not equal influence. And so those groups are more interested in doing something that could be a more dramatic thing. Where some of the bigger groups, they, they don't want to lose their potential for access. Madam President, we face an unprecedented challenge that calls for unity and responsibility. It is not enough right now to say, yes, we can, but rather, yes, we can, yes, we must, and yes, we will. There's a major myth that technology itself will save us, and it's terrifying to me. Let's just fill this entire ocean with algae that will suck stuff out of the climate. Let's build something in the atmosphere that can trap gases better. Let's sequester carbon from coal under the earth. And now people are so desperate because they want a quick fix that doesn't have to change their lifestyles. We'll start with extraction which is a fancy word for natural resource exploitation, which is a fancy word for trashing the planet. What this looks like is we chop down the trees, we blow up mountains to get the metals inside, we use up all the water, and we wipe out the animals. So here, we are running up against our first limit. We are running out of resources. We are using too much stuff. It's very clear that we got in the mess we're in because humans are messing with the natural systems that sustain life on this planet. Why do we want to mess with that even more through these crazy technological schemes and scams? We have recently been made aware that some of you present in this room are proposing a fundamental overhaul of the UN process. You have proposed a new framework that will overturn the balance of obligations and responsibilities enshrined in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. You have erected barriers to exclude your peers from influencing their own futures and in turn have subverted the very principles of inclusion and equality at the heart of the United Nations. This imposition without discussion is tantamount to carbon colonialism, a profoundly destructive development that we, the youth, are compelled to condemn. And what's also terrifying is that these are put forward by very well-resourced, moneyed interests. There's a lot of people who have a very invested interest in profiting off of this crisis. So therefore, carbon trading becomes a political viability because there are elite interests who like that. There's this Berkeley-Cambridge axis of green capitalism, and there's this Texas-Pentagon axis of gray capitalism. It's loosely Republicans and Democrats, but not necessarily because lots of Democrats are tied to the coal industry and whatever else. So we have a situation in the United States where half the environmental movement is pushing for a bill that enshrines cap and trade, and the other half is fighting tooth and nail against it.